Parker County 911, where is your emergency? Uh, my house. What's the address? 152 River Creek Lane. Okay, what's the emergency? Uh, I just killed my mom and my sister. What? I just killed my mom and my sister. This is Jake Evans. In 2012, he grabbed a gun and killed his mom and sister just because he felt like it. Then he called 911 and said he just wanted to kill someone. It doesn't get more cold-blooded and psychopathic than Jake's chilling statements. But what went wrong? What made Jake make this ultimate decision? And could it have been avoided? This is the full story of Jake Evans. This story begins in the upscale community of Alito, Texas, with a large family. Jake Evans was born on May 22, 1995, the only son of Jamie and her husband. But he had three sisters, two older and one younger, by the name of Mallory. When they reached university age, Jake's older sisters left home, but he and Mallory stayed with their parents in this lavish, half a million dollar mansion in the gated community of Alito. E yeah, it doesn't get much safer than that. This family had a stellar reputation. On the outside, they seemed like church-going people. They were warm. The mother, Jamie, adored her children. She instilled in them values. She wanted them to know the importance of keeping a good public image. And Mallory loved her older brother. He was two years her senior and was a serious role model for her. And Jamie was proud to see their relationship blossom. Jamie was a teacher and had also worked as an assistant principal for 15 years. She loved kids, including her own, and she loved offering them what she believed was the best education there was. So in January 2010, Mallory withdrew from school and began homeschooling. About a year later, Jake followed. It wasn't clear what prompted their decision to do so. Did the two kids have problems in school? Was Jamie adamant that she could offer them a better education at home? Or perhaps there were mental health issues involved? As far as the Evans neighbors knew, Jake was a quiet boy who kept to himself and always stayed out of trouble. They'd never heard arguments or disturbing conversations from their home, but who would from a huge mansion yards away from their house? On the evening of October 3rd, 2012, Mallory asked her 17-year-old brother if he wanted to watch a movie with her. Jake said no. Then he went downstairs and grabbed his dad's knife. He rushed back upstairs and began pacing frantically. All he could think about was killing his little sister. But Jake threw the knife away and went to have a pillow fight with Mallory. Then he took his grandfather's gun and shot her in the head. A few minutes later, he shot and killed his mom too. Jake was planning to kill his entire family, including his dad, sisters, and grandparents. But no one else was home. And before he could cross the road to his grandparents' house, he began having second thoughts. Just after midnight on October 4th, he called the emergency service. Parker County 911, where is your emergency? Uh, my house. What's the address? 152 River Creek Lane. Okay, what's the emergency? Uh, I just killed my mom and my sister. What? I just killed my mom and my sister. You just killed your mother and your sister? How did you do that? Uh, I shot them with a... Uh, 22 revolver. Imagine being a 911 dispatcher and hearing this blase, emotionless confession from a 17 year old. It's hard for us to wrap our brain around a teenage boy who kills his mother and sister. Because we think about our own families. If you're not safe with your own family, then who are you safe with? And what is your name? Jake Evans. Jay Evans. Jake Evans. Are you sure they're dead? Yes. The dispatcher made sure Jake would stay on the phone with her while she sent the police on their way to his house. But Jake would do so much more. He would confess his motive, share his thoughts, and reveal the darkest sides of his mind. Are you all right? Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. Hold on just a minute. Where is the gun? Uh, it's on the kitchen counter. Okay. The dispatcher wanted to make sure Jake wasn't in a self-harming state of mind for fear he might use the gun on himself. Knowing Jake was away from the gun, she then proceeded to ask him about his mental health and potential medication. Jake? Yes? Are you on any kind of medication? No. Well, I 
Uh, I've been going to the allergist a lot lately. Yeah. My mom. But no, nothing other than that. Not only was Jake not taking any mind-altering medication, but he had zero medical history regarding mental health issues. Bar Advil and Sudafed, Jake had barely taken any medication ever. So the dispatcher moved on to the motive, much like detectives would do in an interrogation. Okay, do you, um, is there any reason that you were so angry at your mother and your sister? Uh... I don't know. I, uh, I wasn't. It's weird. I wasn't even really angry with them. It just kind of happened. I've been kind of uh, planning on uh, killing for a while now. The the two of them, or just anybody? Pretty much anybody. What would you do if you heard these words? In Jake's case, it seemed like they were coming out of the blue. He had a happy, loving, rich family. He'd even admitted he wasn't angry at any of them. Why? Mm, I don't know. I, uh, I, I don't really like uh, people's uh, kind of attitude. Right. I think they're kind of, they're very, uh, like, you know, emotional, I don't know, verbally rude to each other and stuff like that. Right. And, uh, I don't know. They're, it's okay. It's just my family, I don't know, they're just kind of really, I, I guess this is really selfish to say, but to me, they, I felt like they were just, suffocating me in a way. I don't know. Uh, I, I I think I'm... Obviously, you know, I'm pretty, uh, I guess, evil. But uh, that's... You know, whatever. Okay. Sorry. All right. No, don't be sorry. Talk about reasons for murdering your family. Being evil doesn't really sound like a rational, real-world reason. It sounds more like something out of a horror movie, but we'll get to that later. Uh, were your mom and sister in their beds? No. Uh, uh, this this is really going to mess me up for the, you know, in the future. Uh, let's see, my sister, I told my sister that my mom needed her. Mm -hmm. She was in her room and she came out of her room and uh, I, I shot her and she rolled down the stairs and I shot her again. And then I went down and I shot my mom about maybe three or four times, but I'll never forget this. Uh, okay, that's fine. My, my uh, sister, she, she came down the stairs and she was screaming and I was telling her that I'm sorry, but to just hold still, mm -hmm. that, you know, I was just going to make it go away, you know, but she just kept on freaking out. But finally she fell down and I shot her in the head about probably three times. When the dispatcher asked Jake about his dad's whereabouts, he said he was in Washington, D.C. on business. Then he added he didn't want any visitors in jail. He knew he was going to prison, but he didn't want to see the rest of his family again. Whether that was hatred or remorse over his actions remains unclear. Throughout most of the call, Jake sounded emotionless, describing his actions almost as if he was having an out-of-body experience. But as he turned the porch lights on, expecting the police officers, he started to panic. Are you okay, Jake? I'm just, uh, I'm just thinking about my sister. Yeah. How old is she? She's, uh, 15. 15? Yeah. She, she was, I don't know. She had a really sweet side, but you know, she was kind of, she was kind of racist and I don't know, kind of r r rude to me sometimes. I guess. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. As the dispatcher tried to assure him everything will be all right and to calm him down, he got more anxious. I'm, I'm like really worried about like, you know, like nightmares and stuff like that. <laughs> Um, Are there any type of medication for that and stuff? Well, I, I think there is. I don't know. I'm not a doctor, but, you know, um, 
the the justice system and I'm sure your family will get you the support you need. Sure. Worry about nightmares after gunning your family down. Then unprompted, Jake made another shocking statement. I don't mean to sound like a wimp or anything, but you know, this is, <laughs> wow. I've never like done anything violent in my whole life, you know? If this is true, then what made Jake click out all of a sudden? And how come he was planning to kill his entire family if he never liked violence? Was his statement just an attempt to justify his horrific actions? At the end of the 911 call, the dispatcher guided Jake to the front of the house so the officers could see him. Open the front door. Do you have a, a glass screen door or a glass door or just the front door? Yeah, just the front door. Okay, when you open the front door, step back, put your hands behind your head and slowly walk outside, okay? Jake did as he was told. As soon as he'd called 911, he had already decided he was going to give himself in. He gave himself up without a fight. It's almost as if he realized what he had done as he snapped back into reality. He wasn't going to resist his arrest and he wasn't going to avoid giving a full confession. After all, he'd said enough on the phone already. As he was being held on a $750,000 bond, Jake wrote a four-page confession that would reveal his thoughts prior to, during, and after the murders. I had just got home from the allergist when I started watching Rob Zombie's Halloween. In the movie, a 12-year-old boy murders his stepfather, sister, and her sister's boyfriend. It was the third time this week that I watched it. While watching it, I was amazed at how at ease the boy was during the murders and how little remorse he had afterward. I was thinking to myself, it would be the same for me when I kill someone. So for Jake, the biggest influence was a horror movie that he watched obsessively. He didn't speak of family abuse or any traumatic experience from the past. Everybody else, that's what the movie was, entertainment. But for Jake, it was something more. It was his inspiration to kill. The movie's main character, Michael Myers, has a psychopathic tendency that appealed to Jake. The lack of remorse, the murderous rampage, and the overall lack of emotion when killing their family. Jake wanted to take the Halloween role very seriously. He wrote, my plan was to kill my sister and my mom at my house and then go over to my grandparents and kill my oldest sister, Emily, and my two grandparents. He would only spare his dad because he was out of town, or perhaps he planned the attack for the weekend he'd be out of town, making sure he wouldn't be there to defend his family. Later in his confession, Jake wrote something interesting. The day before he sh his sister, she'd made a racist comment and he felt ever more distanced from his family. The people who are racist, bullies, and who are full of themselves are the really evil ones. And it amazes me because those three qualities are extremely common today. I am very sad because I felt like my own family were becoming the people I hate. If 15-year-old Mallory made a racist comment, it is pretty sad. But killing your sister might just be a little more evil than that. Blaming the victim can often be seen in psychopaths' arguments during interrogations or confessions. By pointing out flaws in the victim's behavior, they justify their action and even take on a moral high ground, like they only sought justice for those wronged by the victim. A very messed up kind of vigilante justice. And now, Jake was identifying with Halloween's Michael Myers even more, as Michael also had a sister with questionable behavior. Jake sees his sister, Mallory, just like Michael Myers sees his sister in the film Halloween. Doesn't try to rationalize with her. Doesn't try to educate her. Doesn't try to work with her. He just has rage and anger directed at her. According to psychologists, Halloween was a solution to Jake's hatred for his family. It was the missing piece to the evil puzzle. Because he hated his family, and he truly was without emotion. But for Jake, he somehow saw that as the key 
to kill his family. Jake also gave a full timeline of events in his written confession. In the first part of the day, he hit golf balls, ran errands with his grandmother, and saw his allergy doctor with his sister. That's when Mallory made her racist comment, and Jake cut her off. Then he watched TV at home. By now, he already had a knife in his pocket and was contemplating killing his sister. Then he decided he would kill his mother, too. I then spent probably over an hour walking nervously around the house thinking how life will never be the same and how I would never see them again. Again. This was before he actually killed his family. Couldn't he have stopped the massacre if he'd already realized he wouldn't see them again? After Mallory invited him to watch a movie with her, he declined and paced around some more. Half an hour later, he came back into the living room and threw a pillow at Mallory. They then had a pillow fight. Yeah, minutes before the murders, Jake connected with his sister. The pillow fight wasn't entirely random. It appears that what Jake was doing was perhaps using the pillow fight to get things ramped up and then be able to pull out the knife and commit the crime. Mallory thought he'd finally forgiven her for her nasty comment earlier. Then Jake invited her to watch a movie with him as a gesture of goodwill, but he was still carrying his knife. He then suddenly changed his mind regarding the murder weapon. He decided to go for his grandfather's gun so as to avoid his family feeling a lot of pain. He didn't want her to suffer the way Michael Myers' sister had suffered after being stabbed multiple times. Jake then grabbed his .22 caliber revolver and went upstairs to Mallory's room. He told her their mom wanted to see her and she was heading downstairs and he her several times in the back and the head. Then he went downstairs to do the same to his mother, but Jamie had time to hear the shots and see her daughter lying in a pool of blood. In fact, Jamie was already at the bottom of the stairs looking into her son's eyes and pleading for her life when he shot four times in the chest. But minutes later, he realized his sister was still alive. In shock, I ran up to my room and was screaming at the top of my lungs that I am really messed up and that I killed my mom and sister. As I emptied the shells on my bed, I heard noises and realized that Mallory was still alive. When I loaded the gun back up, I was shouting I was sorry and ran as fast as I could to kill her. I made sure my mom was dead and her again in the head. Once again, the tragedy could have been stopped at least partially if Jake would have called the emergency services when he realized his sister was still alive. But in his warped reality, he was ending their suffering. Jake's trial was pretty straightforward. The evidence was there and the confession was very clear. When convicting someone of murder, it's important to see if the killer has remorse over their actions. Jake's confession revealed a great deal of guilt. I now know, though, that I'm done killing. It's the most dreadful and terrifying thing I will ever experience. And what happened last night will haunt me forever. But considering his psychopathic profile, this could also be something he wrote at the end of the confession, knowing it would earn him a lesser sentence. Also, he kept talking about how killing his mother and sister was horrible for him, not for them. He expressed how terrifying it was for him and even asked the 911 dispatcher about medication for his upcoming nightmares. Not once did he apologize to his family for this. However, it really seemed like Jake didn't like the experience of killing his family. After all, he could have crossed the road and killed his grandparents and older sister, but something stopped him. Finally, he'd realized that killing his family in real life isn't the same as watching a movie about it. Jake took a gory movie that he watched and turned it into a real life horror story. Jake's trial was a real life horror story for his family, friends, and anyone watching. Jacob Evans walked into the courtroom still looking much like the frail 17 year old teenager of two and a half years ago when he killed his mother and 15 year old sister. He came to court to enter his plea. Guilty. And you're telling me that volunteer. Yes, sir. It was truly heartbreaking to learn of such a senseless crime. And it was really shocking to see all of those who spoke of Jake. No one, absolutely no one, had seen any red flags. Nobody suspected anything amiss with Jake. He just seemed like a normal guy, and that's why it was so shocking. But there might be an explanation for this. A pattern you might often see in a wealthy family is that of sort of a superficial presentation that everything is just fine, a hiding of the flaws, especially if that family's very well established. The Evans family lived in a five-bedroom, five-bathroom mansion 
with a huge pool and a golf course. Jamie was particularly preoccupied with keeping up appearances and had taught her children how to behave in society. Does this mean the family had dark secrets that never came out? Did Jake suffer from a mental disorder and did his family hide it just to keep up appearances? Perhaps they even avoided Jake being treated for it in case people were biased about therapy. Or perhaps Jake's sudden downfall was just a tragic incident that could not have been prevented. When he was arrested, Jake was charged with capital murder. In Texas, this is punishable by either death or life in prison without the possibility of parole. But Jake was only 17 at the time of the murder. So the United States Supreme Court ruled both punishments unconstitutional in his case. His trial began two and a half years after the murder, as the court wasn't sure he was mentally stable enough to stand trial. In fact, as he awaited his trial, Jake spent his time in a mental health institution, much like his idol, Michael Myers. Once Jake was taken away, he has refused to have contact with any family members. He has refused to speak to psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers. He has refused to ever reveal what was actually going on in his emotional brain during the time that he killed his mother and sister. Jake finally stood trial in April 2015. Mr. Ray. What is your plea with regard to count two and count three? Guilty. And you're telling me that voluntarily? Yes, sir. He accepted a plea deal and was sentenced to 45 years in prison with the possibility of parole after 22 years. Jake's family supported this deal and amazed District Attorney Robert DeBoise with their forgiveness for Jake. What that really tells you is the absolute power of forgiveness of this family, given the circumstances of the father and the siblings of Jake Evans to have lost a sibling and their mother. Uh, they have forgiven him to depths that just should inspire everybody in this case. With this amount of love and support, Jake might just realize the gravity of his actions. This is the plot of Rob Zombie's Halloween. On Halloween in Haydenfield, Illinois, having already shown signs of psychopathic tendencies, 10-year-old Michael Myers murders a school bully named Wesley. Later that night, Michael murders his older sister Judith, his mother's boyfriend Ronnie, and Judith's boyfriend Steve. He is then sent to a mental institution and is treated by a child psychologist, but escapes 15 years later and returns to his childhood home to get his knife and his mask and continues on a killing spree. Michael Myers' treatment is futile, and even 15 years later, he has the same tendencies. Will Jake Evans' future be different? Hey, thanks for watching. What are your thoughts on this case? Let me know in the comment section, and before you go, make sure to hit that like button, subscribe to my channel, and click the bell so you never miss another video. See you next time, and stay safe.